somebody lift your hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. hallelujah. So worthy, Lord. So worthy, Lord.
somebody shout it out right now. Hallelujah. As loud as you can. Hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of the mystery. Hallelujah. 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 Hey. hey. It's great to have this guy up here, isn't it? And this girl. Come here. Good to see you guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Amen. Amen. Josh, tell us what's going on. And it's great to be here. Great to be here. Uh, so we have a um, wow. Go. Cool. I'm gonna shift the gear here. <laughs> okay. So uh, we are so excited because actually next month we've been invited to the AGWM. Um, oh, I've lost what it's called right now. The missionary. The missionary uh, candidate. Or is it orientation? Is that what you call it? Yes, the missionary candidate or orientation for us to go with AG. WM, so we're super excited about that step in the process. Wow. So hopefully, uh, you know, we'll just be trucking along right here pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty exciting. That's pretty awesome. Stuff. That's awesome. Isn't it great to see them? Yeah. Amen. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Let's welcome our guests watching online. Great to have you joining with us tonight. Pray the Lord bless you and do big, big things in your life. And uh, if you would, why don't you right now? turn and greet the people that are around you. Welcome to Crossroads Fellowship. We're glad, 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 glad to have you here with us tonight. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask our ushers just to wait till the end. Wait till the end. Well, this is a great evening. Uh, it's good to see Josh and Alicia and, um, Good to see all of you. You know, Crossroads, it's no mystery. Everybody here knows we love missions. We give to missions. We have a lot of things to do with missions. And uh, we, we're blessed this evening to have a, uh, it, it's kind of, you're going to have to explain to everybody kind of what a area director is. But Brian and Renee Webb serve as the Pacific with the Assemblies of God, AGWM. They're the area directors for the Pacific. All those islands, all those different locations. He's the, like the overseer, the, the superintendent over all those missionaries that are on those islands and all those different places. Am I explaining it okay? And so uh, if the Lord called you to go to Tahiti, you'd have to probably talk to to Brian, yeah, y'all are feeling it right now. Oh, come on now, but uh, but I, I invited Brian. Brian is actually over the area where Josh and Alicia are uh, trying to get this appointment uh, completed with the Assemblies of God, and um, uh, we may ask him to share a little bit more about that. But I'm excited to have them with us tonight. They have their oldest uh, with them. Is you're you're the oldest? You're not the oldest. Wow. You got older kids than this? Drew's not your oldest? No? And you got Eli. Well, how old do they go? 27. Wow. All right. And another boy. Yeah, another boy. All right. Well, we're excited to have these guys. And uh, Brian uh, has... Well, maybe I should just let him tell some of these stories that he's got. This guy has been... Uh, in some of the craziest places and the most challenging places with uh, as a missionary. And uh, I asked him if he would come share tonight what God's doing there in the Pacific and in the islands. Would you come tonight? Give Brian Webb a really, really big hand. Good evening. How are y'all? We are Brian and Renee Webb. God's blessed us with four amazing kids. We've served as missionaries for the last 23 years. If you know us at all, you know us as missionaries to Vanuatu. But a while back, Renee and I were asked to serve as area directors for Pacific Oceana. So allow me to introduce you to Pacific Oceana, the world's largest mission field. Pacific Oceana encompasses a third of the Earth's surface, 23 nations, 40 million people, 
spread out over 30,000 islands, speaking more than 1,000 languages. It is by far the most diverse, complex, and isolated mission field on earth. Pacific Oceania hosts every ism in the religious spectrum. Animism, nominalism, secularism, atheism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Judaism, Judaism, Buddhism, Buddhism are all found in Pacific Oceania. Our ministry contexts vary from modern cities to tiny jungle villages where the children of cannibals still fearfully worship ancestral spirits. Nearly half of Pacific Oceania's population is under the age of 24. Loss of traditional roles, severely limited futures have led to epidemic levels of depression and teen suicide. In Chuk, one of our nations, one out of every 40 young men will choose to end their own life before the age of 25. Why does such a massive field have only 15 missionaries? In two words, it's hard. Missions, any kind of missions is hard. Missions that invade Satan's domain, seeks to establish the church where it's never been, that's a special kind of hard. It's hard to get visas, hard to learn the language, hard to understand the culture, hard to find the basic necessities of life. It's hard to live there, hard to communicate, hard to be separated from family, hard to do without those little things like Reese's peanut butter cups. Trust me, it's hard. Hard to be far from home on the holidays. Hard to see your kids grow up not knowing their own family or culture. Hard to live surrounded by poverty. Hard to come face to face with the worst kinds of injustice. Could go on for pages. It's hard. I think if we were to sum up why one third of the world lives without the knowledge of Jesus Christ in one simple sentence it would be, it's hard. It's dirty. It stinks. Bed bugs are a nightmare. Sleeping on the ground is, well, hard. Climbing mountains, slogging through swamps, cutting your way through the jungle, off-roading through knee-deep mud, crossing rivers without bridges, braving big seas and small boats, it's hard. Pouring your heart into planting a church in a village only to have the church and the village burn to the ground, it's hard. Continuing to advance at the risk of arrest, deportation, imprisonment, Beatings, martyrdom, it's hard. Living where there are no stores, no doctors, no schools, no toilets, no internet, no roads, no churches, no comforts, it's hard. Living where there are four-inch cockroaches, eight-inch centipedes, muggers in the alley, roadblocks at the intersection, it's hard. Living where demons prowl, darkness dominates, fear festers, and hope fails. It's hard. As a church, we seem to be united around the idea that things must change. The unreached must be reached. Someone ought to go. Someone should tell those people about Jesus. Someone should plant the church where there is none. Someone should push back at the darkness. Someone should right the injustice. Someone should pay the price Someone should go to the hard places. What we seem a little less clear on is who this someone should be. Someone, but not me, not my children, not my grandbabies. If we could win the world with two weeks mission trips to safe places, it would already be done. Completing the task before us will require doing the hard things. The other thing that we're less than clear on is how hard is too hard. With that missionary serving in the hard place, when do things get hard enough to justify calling it quits, moving on, relocating, changing seasons of ministry, stepping away for a little while? How hard is too hard? When you're tired, when you're sick, when your baby is sick and there's no doctor, when you haven't slept in a month, when fear lurks in your heart like an unwelcome guest, when people violate your personal space, when evil people violate your home, your life, when danger surrounds you, when conditions become unbearable, how hard is too hard? 
Or when does a reasonable person quit? Can I tell you that the cause of Jesus Christ will not be advanced among the unreached by reasonable people? Satan has not held these territories for 2,000 years by creating only reasonable obstacles. If there's a cost too dear for you, he will set it up. If there's a point of pain where you will bail, he will create it. If you will quit, Pastor, you will. How hard is too hard? People will curse you. Police will arrest you. Judges will imprison you. Jailers will beat you. Some of you will die. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Bluntly, he said, look at how they treat me. They will treat you worse. No disrespect intended, but Christ did not call us to come and live our best life now. He called us to come and die and to experience our best life in eternity. So how hard is missions? It's hard like a rugged cross member digging into your shoulder while you trudge down a dusty road outside Jerusalem. Hard like a back crisscross with jagged tears from a whip. Hard like having your beard ripped out. Hard like being spit on by those you're dying to serve. Hard like watching your own mother grieve over you. Yet to those who are watching, a battered and bruised Savior catches their eye and says, Come, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus calls us to notice the state of the harvest. It's white, perishable, overripe, at risk. And yet instead of focusing on the challenge, he calls us to see the opportunity, to be people of action, to seize the day. He calls for resolute men and women who are courageous, who recognize the dangers, but move on in the face of fear. At some point, each of us must determine our role in this divine enterprise. Will we spectate? Will we warm the bench? Will we step onto the field and boldly contest the eternal destinies of men, women, tribes, nations, and peoples? Today, what will you do? Will you warm the bench? Will you step onto the field? A few months ago, I took Zachariah Cunningham to the Solomon Islands on the hopes that he would feel God's call to serve that nation. The places we stayed, food we ate, could best be described as rough. I asked him, Zachariah, what would make a young man like yourself leave the United States to come and work in a place like this? And he answered that when playing football in high school, he never wanted to sit on the bench and watch the game unfold. He said, I made up my mind I would train as hard as I had to train so that when the game started, I could stand on the field and contest the conclusion. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I don't want to sit on the sidelines. I want to step on the field, contest the outcome. What about you? You could get your feet wet. You could stretch your boundaries, discover a whole new world. You could give me between 1 and 11 months, and you could see what missions looks like in the Pacific. Or you could explore missions in the Pacific. You could leave the shore. You could submerge yourself in a novel environment, give one or two years. You could see how God could use you in the Pacific. Or you could dive in. You could take the plunge. You could abandon yourself completely to the largest mission field on earth. You could give your life. You and God could change the destiny of a Pacific nation. God is building an incredible team of missionaries across the Pacific. i just be honest with you. I wrote this and we produced this video about two and a half years ago. We had 15 missionaries. Today we celebrated our 42nd missionary joining the Pacific Oceana family. We are just incredibly excited about that. And, uh, you know, I believe that um, I believe good days are ahead. We're, we're kind of hopeful about Josh and Alicia, just, you know, personally. 
Yeah, we're, we're kind of looking forward to that. Listen, I want to mention something. That wasn't preaching. I'm just talking. We're just, we're still, we'll get to the preaching. We're just talking right now, okay? Yeah, some of y'all thought you was supposed to get out early, didn't you? I, I want to mention something real quick before I preach. This is a couple of books I've written. This one is uh, Hungry Devils and Other Tales from Vanuatu. This one is uh, The Sons of Cannibals. If you like missionary stories, you will love them. There's 50 missionary stories in each one of them. If you don't like missionary stories, you won't like them, so don't bother. We affectionately refer to these as the Pay Our Kids Way to College Fund. All right? So this was my daughter, Alicia, four years, debt-free, praise God. This is my son, Brian, four years, debt-free, praise God. Now, my challenge is I have a third child in college now. Drew is in college. So, so here's how it works, guys. If y'all buy enough copies of these two books, I don't have to write a third book. All right? So they're $15 a piece. Renee will be out there after service. She'll take your cash. She'll take your check. She'll take your credit card. You don't worry. Just go see her. She will take care of you. All right? Hmm. We were, we were down in South Tana in a village called Irrawangan, doing a church plant. And um, while I was there, they had me and about 20 pastors staying in this shack, and this little tin shack, and it came equipped with rats. And the rats were about the size of cats. And what would happen at night is the rats would get up in the rafters up above your head, and they would fight, and, and the loser would fall. And I don't know about you, but when a rat falls beside my head in the middle of the night, it wakes me up. And then there's a particular room that I need to visit. In this case, the room was an outhouse about 50 feet away from the, from the shack. And I, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with outhouses. So I want to give you three quick rules for the next time you deal with an outhouse, all right? The first one is you sing as you go. There is no door. There's a curtain there. People use it sometimes when they forget their toilet paper. We call it a weighted curtain. So uh, you can't go knock on the door. You sing a song, and if, if somebody joins you on the chorus, you just turn around and go back to the house. Sing as you go. Secondly, you exercise light discipline. I understand Americans love light. We like lots of it. Trust me on this one. Your flashlight is to be used to get you to the outhouse, not for inside the outhouse. There are thousands of four-inch cockroaches that live down there in that pit. If your light hits the pit, they will swarm up out of the abyss. It is extremely difficult to sit on that seat and relax enough to take care of things. You just, you keep getting these sensations after you've seen those. So you don't shine your light in the outhouse. Yeah. And the third one is the prayer. You know, I fly back to America, and the, I hit the airport, and one of the first things I, I see is in the bathrooms, they got these little toilet seat covers. Y'all seen those? You can hold them up, you can see through them. That's cute. That won't work for what's on our toilet seats. Missionaries are serious when they pray over their food, and they're serious when they pray over their toilet seats. I've got it down almost to a mantra. It's like, oh, God, sanctify this seat. So I, I don't want to paint you too graphic of an image here tonight, but I, I was standing in the door of that little shack. It's pouring rain. I, I try to convince myself I don't need to go. I know I need to. So I tuck my toilet paper up underneath my arm because it's no good once it's wet, right? I do the dash through the, uh, through the rain. I'm singing my song. Nobody joins me. I get to the curtain. I turn off my flashlight. I got my flashlight between my mouth, my toilet paper tucked underneath my arm. I'm backing past the curtain and pulling down my trousers. I mean, you, you can't like go in, turn around, pull that. No, there's not space for that. You just kind of, it's one smooth motion past the curtain and you're sitting down at the same time. And, and, I, and I'm mumbling my prayer over my flashlight and I sit down there and I feel something. And it's warm. And it's hairy. And it's all down my thigh. And if you want to know what was in the outhouse with me, you're going to have to buy a copy of the books. That's as good as I can get. If you, if you don't want to buy a copy now, there's nothing I can do for you. 
Mm. You ever, you ever, you ever pull up to the stoplight and the and the person in front of you has got their phone out and they're doing this number right here. It's okay as long as the light's red, isn't it? When the light turns green and their head's still down, then what do you do? If you sanctify, it's a great test of sanctification. If you sanctify, you give it a little beep beep, right? But if you if you do the beep beep and they still don't move, then what are you going to do? <laughs> if you're like me, you want to stick your head out the window and say, "Hey, green means." Thank you. Yes. It is awful when someone misses the signal. It is worse when the church misses the signal. I did a study on the 40 days from the resurrection to the ascension of Jesus Christ, and I found in there 32 distinct ways in which the church is commanded to go. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give you all 32 tonight, but I want to give you a handful, all right? First one we're going to found in, in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. You've heard it a lot of times. It's the, it's the Great Commission. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If I were going to summarize the Great Commission in two words, I would simply say, go everywhere. Go everywhere. Listen, the going is important. I've had more than one professor of Greek pull me off to the side and say, Brian, you're, you're misunderstanding this text. The key verb is not in the going, but in the making of disciples. The going is almost incidental. Well, that's great. I believe in making disciples. Did you notice where Jesus told us to make disciples? He told us to make disciples of all nations. And if we're going to make disciples of all nations, someone is going to have to go. Telling is important too. You, you ever have it, anybody say to you, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Sounds good, right? I mean, we understand what they're saying. Live such a good Christian life, your neighbors will interpret that as you loving God and serving God. But what if your neighbors don't know there is a living God? Listen, we have a story that needs to be told. There is a message we have that the world needs to hear, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he died in my place, that he rose again on the third day, that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, that right now he is praying for you and soon, very soon, he's returning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This world needs to hear this message. So the going matters, the telling matters. Can I tell you everywhere matters? Renee and I had the opportunity to go to Kosherai. You all know where that is? I didn't either. First you got to get to Honolulu. Then you leave Honolulu and you go to Madril. You fly from Madril to a little island called Kwajalein. When you leave Kwajalein, then you get to land in Kosherai. It's, it's, it's a little postage stamp of an island. You can drive all the way around the thing in less than an hour. I believe there are something like 6,000 Koch Ryans in the world. It's, it's such an isolated place. You can't understand how did the first Koch Ryans ever get there in the first place. But, but, you know, Renee and I went there and we worshiped with those folks. And, you know, the same Holy Spirit that was moving in our service here tonight was moving in their service there. Why? Because to God, everywhere matters. Let me give you another one. Matthew chapter 28, verse 7. The angels have gone down to the to the cemetery to anoint Jesus, the angels. The women have gone down to the cemetery to anoint Jesus' body for burial. 
And, and when they get there, they're met by an angel who said, you know, why are you looking for the, the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And then verse number 7, the angel tells them, then go quickly and tell his disciples. There is an urgency in our going. It's due to the perishable nature of the harvest. We have but a short window of opportunity. Have you ever gone to pour milk out over your cereal in the morning and instead of it be this nice smooth arc, it comes out clump, clump, clump. Hmm? And you, and you, oh, that's a bad smell. And then you look and, and the, the problem is right there, clearly written in black ink. It says, use by, and the date was two weeks ago. Huh? Now listen, you can examine yourself carefully, but I'll assure you there's, there's no place written on you an expiration date. Yet the word of God tells us it is appointed unto man once to die, and after death the judgment. You need to understand that every person you're going to interact with this week, whether in the workplace or at school, or in your neighborhood, is an eternal person. They will spend eternity with heaven, with God in heaven, or they will spend eternity separated from God in hell. And you and I, we've got this brief window of opportunity in which we can attempt to influence their eternal destiny. And I will tell you that with each person you meet this week, there will be a day that is the last day that anyone ever gets to tell them about Jesus. Understand me. We do not have casual conversations. Every conversation we have has eternal weight. I urge you to bear that in mind as you're interacting with people this week. But I urge you to bear it in mind that there's still some 2 billion people in our world today that have yet to hear the name of Jesus that has no one who speaks their language that knows this story. They too are eternal. They too can be saved. But someone's got to get there. Can I give you another one? Y'all still with me? All right. John, John chapter 20. Verse 23, Jesus told his disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. I would say simply go forgiving. You know, I grew up in church. And, and when I say I grew up in church, we had church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Tuesday night was Royal Rangers Missionettes. Wednesday night was service. Thursday night was visitation. Evangelistic service was Saturday night. And if we wanted to be spiritual, we added two nights to that and called it revival. I mean, we went to church, folks. But uh, I never heard anybody preach from this verse. I, I started preaching when I was just a kid, 15 years old. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I'd ever preach from this verse. The thing about it is, it, it just kind of clashes with our theology. I mean, we, we, have, we have direct access to Jesus. We don't need someone else to forgive us. I don't know about you. I, I had always assumed that one of the translators was a closet Catholic and just kind of slipped this verse in there to justify the confessional. That's what it seemed like to me. A while back, I had the opportunity to be up in the Tibetan Plateau. I, I was there because there's a, there's a group of people called the Pumi. And at the time that I was there, there were no churches and no known Christians among the Pumi. And I went there for Worldview Magazine to write about them in the hopes that you would see their faces and read their story and the Holy Spirit would convict you and you would go and tell them about Jesus. They, they, they took me to this little village and in this village to a log cabin. And they told me, they said, Brian, the same family has been living in this log cabin for the last hundred years. Had the red clay tile roofs that come out and do the little ski jumps in the corners. The big double doors with the symbols on them to ward off the spirits. We opened up those double doors and... I stepped through in the first row of rooms on each side are the hog pens because it's too cold to keep the pigs outside. I step into a courtyard and a chicken comes at me this way and a goose comes at me that way. 
Under water buffalo standing in the middle of the courtyard chewing its cud. Over on the left-hand side is the kitchen. That little lady invited me into her kitchen, and I, I wish I could take you there with me. We step in. There's like a, a, a bench over on the right side, and in front of that, a little coffee table. And then just a, a little further forward is, a, is an open pit fire, and behind that, there's a shrine. And then, then over on the left, hanging in the smoke, there's some, some shoulders and hams and sausages. And I, and I sit there on that little bench, and she, she poured me a cup of green tea. But before she brought it to me, she stopped in front of that shrine, and she tipped a bit of that tea out, and, and then she brought it to me. And as I'm sipping my green tea, she goes and she pulls down a shoulder and some sausages and chops them up and prepares me a small plate of food. But again, when she brings me that plate of food, she stops in front of that shrine and she drops some of that meat off into the fire. I ask her, I said, Auntie, who, who are you offering these sacrifices to? She said, I'm offering them to the king of hell. You can look up the king of hell in Tibetan Buddhism after service, but I can describe him for you. He wears a crown of human skulls, has a leering face. He holds a blood-stained knife in one hand, severed human head in the other. He's depicted standing astride a human corpse and encircled with flames. They believe that he guards the entrance to hell. I, I, I asked her, I said, Auntie, why would you offer sacrifices to the king of hell? She said, well, I know there are other gods out there, but they are too high for me. They cannot hear me. Only the king of hell can hear my prayers. So I, so I offer him sacrifices in the hopes that when I die and when I go to hell, he will be kind to me. I cannot imagine a more bleak perspective of eternity. You know the tragedy of her story? God is too high for her, and he's too high for you, and he's too high for me. And that's why when we took our best efforts at being good and righteous and lifted them up to God and they fell miserably short, that he wrapped himself in human flesh and he walked among us and he opened up the door for relationship again. But someone has got to go and tell her. I mean, here's, here's what it will take. It will take someone leaving their home, leaving their job, leaving their family, traveling to the far side of the world, learning another language, learning another culture. And, and it will take someone sitting down and drinking cups of green tea until the conversation turns to matters where you can turn it to Jesus. And you say to me, well, now, Brian, let's think about this. What if I did do that? I've got a promising career. I've got a good job. What if I did lay it all down and, and, and went to the far side of the world? Would she believe? I don't know. But I'll make you a promise. If she didn't, one of her neighbors would. And then another, and then another, and then another. And, and before very long, you'd have, a, you'd have a group of folks coming together and, and, and you know what, a language that had been used to offer only offerings to the king of hell would be used to sing praises to the king of kings. Why? Because the church of Jesus Christ, it is militant, it is triumphant. The gates of hell, even the king of hell cannot withstand it. What, what is lacking is not the power of the gospel. What is lacking is not the power of the Holy Spirit. What is lacking is the goer. As I said in her kitchen, I noticed that the back wall is covered with white ovals. And I asked her, I said, I said Auntie, what's the, what's the meaning of these ovals? She said, well, it's our tradition on Chinese New Year that that every person living in the home will dip their thumb into white paint and press it against the wall. There were long, skinny ovals, and there were short, fat ones. There was little bitty 
tiny baby ones. There were, there were ones that were fresh and crisp, and there were, there were others that were so covered with creosote you could just barely make out the outline. But as I sat there and I looked at that wall, the Holy Spirit illuminated this passage for me. And for the first time I understood, because he said, Brian, this is a genealogy of the unforgiven. These are the ones my church withheld forgiveness from. Maybe you'd sit here tonight and you'd say, Brian, I've never maliciously withheld anything from them. I know. I know. But you know. You know. And they don't. And we simply have to do whatever it takes so that they can know. Can I give you one more? Y'all be patient with me. John 21, 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. I like that. They said to him, we will go with you. Very simply, go together. You know, the... um, The disciples had been on this roller coaster ride. They had expected Jesus to be crowned king. Instead, he was crucified. They had thought their hopes and dreams were over, and then he rose from the dead. I don't know about you. I assumed that from the resurrection to the ascension that that Jesus had spent those 40 days with the disciples. But when you read the book of John closely, you discover that that's not true. Jesus, Jesus would be with them, and then Jesus would leave them. And they did not know where he had gone or when he would return or, frankly, if he would return. I mean, we know the whole story. They didn't have it. In this particular case, it says, and eight days later, Jesus appeared to them again. So so the disciples were going through, boy, the disciples were going through an uncertain future and an uncertain present. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I mean, they they didn't know what the script was. They didn't know what was going to happen next. And it's in a moment of uncertainty and discouragement that Peter says, I'm going fishing. This was not, I'm going down to the sea for a little bit of recreation. This was, I have tried following the Messiah. It has not worked. I'm returning to the family business. And the phenomenal thing about that was the response of the other disciples. Remember, not all of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. Another was a zealot. But their answer to Peter was, we will go with you. And in so doing, they set a precedent that is still in effect to this day. And it is very simple. Christians go together. Hallelujah. That's why we're in church on Wednesday night in the middle of a pandemic. Why? Because Christians go together. Amen. That's why we, that's why we give in the offering, and that's why we pay our tithes. I assume y'all still do tithes around here. Yeah. That's why, that's why we do that. Why? Because we look around and we say, wow, there's some things that need to happen here at Crossroads that I can't do by myself and you can't do by yourself, but if we will go together, we can make it happen. Hmm? Did, you know that's what, did you know that's what missions giving is? Did you know that? I mean, when, when you're giving, I see sometimes when a pastor comes up, you know, and they'll say, you know, we're going to take an offering for these missionaries. And, and I see, I see what happens. I see that, that lady sitting there, and she's thinking about my wife. And she's thinking, that lady uses an outhouse, takes her bath in a river, washes her kids' clothes in a river. And, and I see that elbow get into action. And she gets her husband in the ribs, and she's like, you know, bless her heart. Give that lady an offering. Huh? No, you understand? But, but missions is not a bless their heart kind of thing. That's not what that is. You see, when, when you are giving, what you are doing is you're choosing the amount of time 
that you want to go with me. Yeah. You're, you're looking at that and you're saying, well, I make $10 an hour. I think tonight I'll give him one hour. Well, I can tell y'all are not as excited about this as I am. Hallelujah. You know, one of the countries I'm responsible for is, Gua- is the Solomon Islands. And um, if you know anything about World War II history, the Japanese were rolling through the Pacific and no one could stop them until the U.S. Navy landed the 1st Marine Division on a little island called Guadalcanal. They were told to take and hold the airfield. And after a very intense battle, they realized that to hold it, they would have to hold the high ground above it. Today, that high ground is called Bloody Ridge. It's a narrow, flat-topped ridge, no wider than this auditorium. It runs inland from the beach a couple of miles before dipping down into a saddle, and then it rises to the mountainous interior, Guadalcanal. Those Marines outnumbered 10 to 1 under undersupplied, dug themselves in in foxholes along that ridge. I, I went and I stood in that last foxhole because there two Marines had a 50 caliber machine gun and their job, their mission was to see that no Japanese forces could cross that saddle. Early in the battle, a Japanese soldier threw a hand grenade into their foxhole. It blinded one of the Marines and it severed the thumb of the other but for five hours unrelieved those two Marines held their position the blind man firing the machine gun the lame man telling him where to fire alone neither one could have completed their mission but together they changed the tide of a battle changed the course of a war changed the trajectory of history And I'm going to tell you that when we look at a world so desperately in need of Jesus, sometimes we feel like, well, I can't do anything about that. And that's true. But if you and I will go together, we can change the eternal destiny of nations. And that is what missions is. It is you and I going together. You need to go with me in prayer. You need to go with me in giving. Hallelujah. Some of you need to go to the post office. You need to get an application for a passport. You need to fill it out. You need to get on that plane. You need to go. You need to go. Just you close your eyes for just a minute? Father, I thank you so much for your presence here tonight. I thank you for your people and this incredible opportunity to, to, to share your word and to worship in this amazing church. Now, God, I ask you, Holy Spirit, hover over this sanctuary. I believe tonight that there are men and that there are women that you are challenging. You are challenging to give their very lives for your kingdom. You are are challenging some to abandon a home, to abandon occupation, to abandon their homeland so that those who sit in darkness can behold a great light. And I pray your Holy Spirit challenge us tonight. Challenge us tonight that we would be willing to say to you, yes, Lord, I will Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand to your feet for just a second? I believe the Holy Spirit is here. And He is speaking to us even now. Renee and I are going to come. We're going to be in the front for just a few moments. If you're here tonight and God is challenging you, you'd say, Brian, as you were speaking, God was challenging me you to come. I want you to let us pray with you. We're not going to try to call anybody to the mission field tonight. We want to help you hear the voice of God and respond in obedience to Him.
light that falls all around me. You're the first thought on my mind. Let our voices rise. All creation cries, singing out in endless alleluia from this moment on. Join in heaven's song.
Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, honor the Lord tonight. Just worship Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name, 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 oh bless your name, Lord, hallelujah, 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 thank you, Jesus. Isn't it wonderful that we get to know Jesus? I love hearing the heart of a missionary. I love hearing the the call. And we're all called to be a missionary also. The mission may be just here, but it's also called to go and be a part one of these days we're going to get these trips going again and I look forward to going to some of these places but I I have to tell you that because we have gone I don't have regrets that we never went but that would be a terrible place to be is to get at the end of your life and go I had all those opportunities and I never even tried challenge you to be faithful Anita you're my hero girl Anita's headed to Thailand I'm excited missionary associate very excited one of my early morning prayer partners she's she's a real deal she's a real deal Josh come here a minute Kind of bring everybody up to speed where you are. What's tell a little bit more? What you, what you do know? Can you share anything about the journey of a field that you're looking at? I, I can tell you where we're trying to go. Uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um. So you guys all got. You can be seated, right? They can be seated. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You may be seated. Yeah, I'm sorry. Formally, I'm sorry. I'm you may <laughs> you may sit, be seated. But um, so you guys got to hear uh, Pastor Brian's heart. I guess you're not Pastor Missionary Brian. Do they do that, Missionary Brian? You got to hear his heart and about where the area that he's in. And our journey has been: we were like, "Yes, we want to go," right? Uh-huh. And then the COVID monster shut down a bunch of stuff, yeah. and it was really strange. So. It gave us this time to go, Lord, if you could send me anywhere, where would it be? Where would I go? Where where would I thrive? And who do you want me to meet? How have you prepared me my whole life to go somewhere? And, <clears throat> you know, some of the, the, the early part of the journey was, uh, I don't know how, what you want me to go, like, tell like all different parts of the story or like just where we're going yeah. now or wanting to go okay if you get like, going too be, long I'm going to kick you off the stage if y'all want to go ahead and prepay me for books uh, I will start working on them do I need uh, they're going to gonna be I don't know I don't know how much money they're going to be yeah they're not going to write a book okay. not right now anyways okay <clears throat> anyways throughout the journey God has kind of revealed to us a lot about who we are is I guess what I'm trying to say. And it, and it makes you really analyze like, where would I fit? And who do I, who do I need to fit with? And so, you know, 
uh, last time we were here, we were talking about wanting to go to Vietnam, and we were super excited about that. And we got to talking with regional director, uh, an amazing guy named Jeff Hartzenfeld, and he was uh, kind of giving us some direction. And we started talking, and I asked him, uh, you know, about Vietnam and some of the things about Vietnam. And we told him we want to go somewhere that's never been reached. You know, we want to go somewhere that doesn't have missionaries there right now. And, oh, he goes, oh, would you want to go to Laos? And I was like, oh, let me think about Laos. And, you know, we we talked, we actually got on Zoom and we did a Zoom call with uh, the Sobchaks, which are some amazing missionaries that have a community center there in, in Laos. And they're awesome. And I, t- but I told, I told Jeff, I said, I don't know that that's where we're leaning. I said, there's somewhere further Southeast Asia that we really like. And we're wondering, have we don't see that there's ever been missionaries that have been there. Can we go there? Is that a, like, is this a possibility? And um, I asked him, I said, do, do missionaries go to New Zealand? Like, is that a place that y'all would send missionaries? And he was like, actually, we don't have any missionaries right there right now, but we do have one that's trying to get there. You know, they're approved, but they got the COVID monster squeezing them to not go yet. And so we've been talking uh, the AG regional director that Jeff Hartsonfeld I just spoke to you about and then he plugs me into he said you need to talk to this guy Brian Webb he's the area director over Asia Oceana and he would be the area director that would that you'd need to talk to so let's get a Zoom meeting going and we get a message from Brian and he's like um, hey I see you guys are in Houston uh, I know we're supposed to set up a Zoom but would y'all want to meet for you know like just meet up or something and I think we asked you what part of Houston y'all were in or something. And you said, oh, you said we're in Huffman. We see you're in Houston. How far is that? And I was like, that's like 20 minutes. Let's go to Italianos. And he was like, we like Italianos. We've been there a bunch already. We're like working our way through the menu, trying to try all their stuff. And so we were like, how weird is that? That like we're feeling this, you know, direction and these guys that are, normally on the other side of the world are like 20 minutes away from us. So we went and met with them. And I think we sat there for probably two hours, maybe like we ate our food. We ordered dessert. We drank coffee. The waitress kept coming back and she was like, are you guys okay? okay?" (laughs) And we're like, yeah, we're good. We're just, uh, we're just having a good time. And then we went back again and then they've been to our house. And so we've really gotten to know them and um, have a good time with them. But there's this culture in uh, New Zealand that was there before the Anglos, the Maori people. They were there before the Anglos. And that's the native culture. That's the indigenous church that needs to be revived. And now there's tons of people that look like me, you know, Anglo. And they talk a bit different. I think they put a question mark at the end of every sentence. <laughs> and they say stuff like, good day, mate. <laughs> and I'm going to have to work on all that. Once I start one, I can't stop. So I have to break the pattern. Um <clears throat> Oh, sorry, babe. Go ahead. But, okay, I was just breaking the pattern. Yeah. But anyways, uh, we've talked with them a lot of, about New Zealand, but really we want to go wherever the Lord can use us the most. We don't want to be like, yeah, we just want to go there because it's awesome. But there is a there is an indigenous culture. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research about it, and yep. uh, the, the language that they speak at one time back in like, I think it was 2013, if I remember correctly, there was like less than 2% of the country was speaking Maori. And so there's this big initiative in the government trying to push it into the public schools that that would be revived. And so now there's more people, more and more people speaking Maori. And so we started talking about, you need to learn the language. I was like, but they just speak English. And then I came back to him later and I was like, I think I need to learn Maori, that's going to be the language we have to figure out. So we're still in this candidate orientation process. Yes, and I will say, process. yes, I will say, though, that when we started this whole thing, we started with just, yes, God send me anywhere. And so I believe that the doors and the borders will be open eventually. But if not, we have also said, God send us where the borders are open. So good. Yeah, there's a lot of never reached people. Yeah. And that's the thing. There's people that have never been reached and that's why. Mm-hmm. Because it's hard, right? Mm-hmm. It's hard. So you got to be willing to go find out what that hairy thing is in the outhouse. <laughs> 
totally kidding. Are you willing to do that? I mean, you know. Go get your passport. That's awesome. (laughs) Proud of you. That's great. So, closing out the service tonight, I want to do something. Uh, I want to ask Drew to come over here. Drew, would you come right down here? Come right down here. And uh, you can, hey, you can feel free to buy the book and find out what the hairy thing is. But an MK, a missionary kid, uh, is a beautiful thing. And uh, that they're willing to go with dad and mom and be with them. And he's grown up on the mission field. And so would you guys bring a couple of buckets, bring a couple of buckets. His brother's here, Eli, and Eli's at back in the youth. And so what I would like to do tonight um, is I'm going to put a couple of buckets down here. And one is for Drew. No, no, right here. Let's put them right here in the middle. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right there in the middle. And so we're going we're gonna to receive an offering And I want you to give tonight. And if you'll just bring it and put it in the buckets. And then my brother right here is going to count whichever one's the most. And he's going to give his brother probably the last. No, I don't know. But it's just money for them. Just some spending money for them. We've already got these guys an offering. We're going to give them a check. We're going to give them a good honorarium for being here tonight. But wouldn't it be great to get this college student, this Bible student, He's going to Bible school right now. And you could just put some money in his pocket. You could put some some gas money in his pocket, some cool clothes money in his pocket. You know, whatever it is you want to go buy, it, it's for you, okay? And so why don't we pray, and then I'll give you an opportunity to do that, and then we'll close the service out. I want to thank Brian for being here. Can we give Brian and Renee a big hand? And Drew, thank you so much for being here also. And so when you come down, just shake the missionary guy's hand right there, right? And uh, thank you so much. And let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for Crossroads. Thank you for Josh and Alicia for their love, their passion for you. And God, continue to open the doors, continue to reveal the field, continue to reveal the country, work out all the details and all the support and all the areas and all the things that have to be done, God, and just help in Jesus' name. And Lord, let Drew and Eli get a good offering in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Would you come? Come, come, come.